to the Buddhist scriptures uh, immediately after the Buddha um, realized full awakening. He <clears throat> it occurred to him to teach the Dhamma, to share the truth that he'd found with others. And then when he thought of doing this, he thought, nah, what a hassle. <coughs> he said, why should I bother trying to teach the Dhamma? I've, I've, I've put all this effort, all of this striving to try to realize the Dhamma. And people are so full of defilements, so full of attachments, so full of confusion. How can they possibly realize the depth of this Dhamma? And he mentioned two things he mentioned as being particularly difficult to understand and those two things were dependent origination and Nibbana and uh, so uh, because I like a challenge and I'm sure you all like a challenge as well I'm going to talk tonight about those two things <laughs> dependent origination and Nibbana just so that we get the hardest topics in Buddhism out of the way everything will be a breeze after this Although I have to admit that sometimes it seems to me that working out the intricacies of bhikkhuni vinaya is more difficult than understanding <laughs> dependent origination. But <clears throat> So this thing called dependent origination is a very interesting idea. It's a very uh, peculiar... Um, in a way, a very peculiar teaching to have as the centerpiece of a religious doctrine. And uh, that it was a centerpiece, there is no doubt, because when we look in um, <clears throat> inscriptions in ancient India, uh, everywhere we find the uh, uh, very famous epitome of the Dhamma, which was a verse originally attributed to Asaji, one of the Buddha's first disciples when he spoke with uh, to Venerable Sariputta before he became a monk. And Sariputta asked him to please summarize the essence of the Dhamma. And so that's a very nice story um, because Asaji was walking for alms and uh, through the village. And Sariputta saw him and he thought, wow, that monk's very impressive. He was very, very composed. Uh, very relaxed, very uh, restrained, and uh, his face is very bright. looks You know, looks like he's looks like he's he's realized something, realized some dharma, some truth. And so he went and asked him, "Please, venerable sir, please teach me." And uh, <clears throat> Asaji said, "Oh, listen, I've just I've just gone forth. I'm just a young monk. I don't really know very much. Actually, he was already an arahant <laughs> at that time." But that was his humility that he said, oh, I really don't know very much, you know. And uh, so he put to said, please, no, please just teach me just, just the gist. And uh, so Asaji said, those things that have arisen uh, from a cause, uh, their arising and also their cessation, this is the doctrine of the great monk, the great samana, the Buddha. And when... <coughs> <coughs> when he gave that very brief teaching, Sariputta uh, realized stream entry, realized the first stage of the Dhamma. He had already been an ascetic for many years and been practicing spiritual practice for many years. And so he was ripe for understanding and just needed that little bit. And uh, he, he saw the Dhamma. And that verse is uh, then repeated uh, countless hundreds of times uh, on inscriptions on all the great stupas and monuments of ancient India. So it was obviously universally known and very uh, respected as uh, being a summary of the Buddha's teachings. But what does it mean? Why is it so important? What, what role does it have in religious life? Well, if we look at most religions, we see that they, uh, they want to say something about origins, don't they? 
and we, we, we regard this as being an important part of our religions. We, you know, most we used to, if we're from a, a Christian background or Judaic background or um, uh, Islamic background, we're used to reading the, the, what we call the Old Testament and it starts out with a myth of origins telling how the world came to be. And uh, of course these things are very uh, common throughout the world. Now, uh, that particular myth of origins in the Bible, the one that starts, of course the Bible has two completely different origin stories in Genesis. And the first one tells the stories of how the world was created in seven days. Now that particular one is actually the world's first piece of uh, workplace legislation. And uh, <clears throat> it's actually an industrial relations program because the, that, when that was composed, when the Hebrew people were slaves in Babylon, and it was about five, 600 BC or something like that, they were enslaved. And uh, so they sort of got together and uh, cooked up this creation myth where the God rested on the seventh day. And they, so they told the Babylonians, listen, we've got this ancient myth that has been handed down for time immemorial, it tells us that we have to rest on the seventh day. And uh, so they told that to their Babylonian captors and they said, okay, okay, so rather than annoying the Hebrews too much, they said, okay, have Sunday off. <laughs> so this is true, this is how, this is how that, story, that story functioned. So we still have Sundays off thanks to that. So we should be very grateful. Yeah? And so this shows, it's very interesting, we, we laugh at that, but it's actually true, isn't it? Because of the power of that myth, it's got a tremendous hold on our imagination. And certainly from Western culture, it has a decisive effect on our imagination and we still have Sundays off. Yeah? Even though that's a myth created all those thousands of years ago and still has that hold. It's very interesting, isn't it? And so one of the things we want, we, somehow we want to know about origins and we feel that a religion should as part of explaining the meaning of life, it should inform us and um, uh, enlighten us as to where we came from. We somehow feel that the question of where we come, came from is, in, is important in understanding where we're going. It's almost like it's just an intuition. Yeah? It's, it's not necessarily a rational one. It's not an, it's, when you start to reflect on it, it's not automatically obvious that that's the case. <clears throat> but we feel that it is the case. Now, the Buddha, of course, as is well known, uh, rejected the idea of a, a, an ultimate first beginning and uh, rejected the idea that there was like a, you know, a God who could sort of stand outside the world and say, let there be light, and then there was light, and all of these kinds of things. And uh, he rejected it for philosophical reasons which are probably not dissimilar uh, to the philosophical reasons that uh, perhaps uh, some modern uh, uh, secularists might also dismiss such notions. For example, the idea of a creator God involves the notion of an uncaused cause. Okay? So this is what uh, we call sometimes the prime mover from Aristotle and Aquinas and so on. That there's a, a cause which wasn't itself caused. And this notion is regarded as being uh, incoherent according to a Buddhist way of thinking. So from a Buddhist way of thinking, we don't try to explain things in terms of an ultimate first beginning but we explain things in terms of an ongoing process. And so we, um, we, we, we think in terms of a cycle. Okay? And we get our inspiration from things like the cycles of nature, the cycles of the seasons, day and night, and so on. All these things going round and round. And uh, <clears throat> so the Buddha expressed this teaching very famously in what we know as the 12 links of dependent origination. Now, this is just a short little talk here tonight and I don't have time to go into all of the, the details of all the 12 links of dependent origination. That would take uh, quite some time. But just to notice a few things. One thing is that the particular details of how that's played out was influenced by 
and decisively influenced by the uh, the myths and uh, that, and 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 philosophical texts that were available in the Buddha's culture. He used the words that were available to use. He used the patterns which were already established. It's been proven that parts of dependent origination uh, are reflective of ideas evolved, particularly in a famous creation hymn in the Rig Veda, uh, which originated a thousand years before the Buddha. So he took these materials and then shaped them for his own purpose. Now, what dependent origination does? First of all, it starts out with ignorance. Okay? So the beginning was ignorance. So that sounds a bit depressing, doesn't it? So normally we, you know, you say in the beginning was God. So you see, you have, you know, you have this kind of very beautiful idea of, of this kind of all power. And then, and then what, if, you, if you imagine the, the, that, that, that in the beginning was God, then the world becomes a fall because somehow the world is less perfect than God is. Yeah? So if you imagine, and this of course is a problem for a theistic context because, well, why did God create the world? If God's perfect, why did he create such an imperfect world? Uh, but from a Buddhist point of view, we don't have that problem because we started out with ignorance. And in a sense, that's quite, um, you know, if we compare it with, with uh, natural processes, it's quite reasonable, isn't it? For example, us in our lives. We start out as babies, we're born, we're ignorant. Gradually we get old and we learn things. Yeah? So that's how our life goes. We start out with ignorance and gradually we learn knowledge. It's also perhaps, and uh, some people might dispute with this, but it's also perhaps uh, evident in, in, say, the natural world as a whole, where if we look at the, um, the, the, the process of evolution, that in the far distance past you had sort of seas swimming with kind of swampy slime and stuff like that. Well, that's pretty ignorant, isn't it? Yeah? Gradually you get, you know, you get sort of plants and animals and, and intelligence starts to arise. Yeah? And now we have human culture and all of these kinds of things. And so to a certain extent we can see that there's a, a, a progression from ignorance to a state of knowledge in some ways. I don't want to say that it has to be like that. I'm just pointing out the fact that it does seem to be some kind of progression like that. Now, so the idea that we start with ignorance to me has a certain uh, plausibility. And ignorance in this particular context means specifically ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. So we're ignorant of suffering, the origin of suffering, the ending of suffering, and the path leading to the ending of suffering. And because we're ignorant, and that's where all our problems come from. And again, this has a certain plausibility, doesn't it? Yeah? We make mistakes because we're stupid. Yeah? <laughs> that's basically what it's saying. We're stupid and we stuff things up and it hurts. We hurt ourselves and we hurt others. Yeah? And so this gives us something that we can investigate. Yeah? Ignorance is something we can investigate, we can reflect on. And so when we're talking about this, we're not talking about some kind of primordial kind of thing that existed at the beginning of the cosmos, which we can never know anything about. We're talking about a force which is actually operating inside our own minds right now. Okay? So we cast our mind back, look into the mind, where is the ignorance? So of course the ignorance at a deep level is those things which you're not aware of, okay? Uh, I've just been reading a very interesting book by uh, Oliver Sacks. Many of you may know the, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. And this one is... Uh, when, when I say many of you may know the man who mistook his wife for a hat, I mean, maybe you might be the wife who's been mistaken for a hat, I don't know. But he wrote a book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And he writes about lots of different kinds of um, neurological and psychological kind of very strange phenomena. Now, this particular book is very interesting called A Leg to Stand On. And it's very good because it's actually his own experience. And uh, he was, when he was a healthy young man, he went for a nice walk up a mountain, a very remote mountain, and went for a walk. 
and uh, encountered a big bull on his walk. And then for some reason he got hit by a panic attack and ran down the mountain away from this bull who was just kind of sitting there eating some grass or something, fell over and completely destroyed his knee and uh, completely dislocated and, and shredded. It wasn't just broken, it was completely useless. And there he was alone at the top of a mountain. So he managed to slide down from the mountain, got picked up um, by a few hunters, uh, and it was a very dangerous experience. He came, came very close to death, but he survived. He got taken back, taken to hospital. They operated on him. Of course, he's a doctor, and the doctors operated on him. And But what was interesting was that he, uh, he as the condition evolved, he realized that his leg was actually completely dead, uh, not, not merely just you know injured and so on, but there was completely no feeling in it whatsoever and it just almost completely muscles wasted away and everything like that. It didn't even feel like proper flesh. And he couldn't like twitch his knee or anything like that, couldn't, couldn't make any kind of movement or get any kind of feeling or any response at all. And then as time went on, he began to feel completely alienated from his legs so that he couldn't even imagine that it was there. Yeah? It just wasn't part of him anymore. And he would have this kind of series of terrible dreams where this became part of his dream imagery where he, he, his leg just wasn't there, it wasn't his. It was just a lump of chalk because it was in a cast. And so he said the cast, it was like a lump, a solid lump of chalk or it was like hollow but not hollow filled with space, hollow filled with absolutely nothing. And so he just had this complete existential alienation from his leg. He couldn't... See, it, there, was, there was literally nothing there. And then he began to investigate it. And it's actually, he remembered that he'd actually encountered this with some of his patients and had kind of dismissed it as this kind of weird phenomenon. But it's actually a recognized phenomenon. And one patient who, you know, got, got up in bed, bed in the morning and, 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 and sort of rang the nurse and to get them, take, get, take this thing out of bed. I've got this thing in my bed with me. Get it out, you know? They're saying, well, what thing? He's saying, this thing, this thing here, I don't know what it is. It's been put here. It's, it's your leg. And then he's saying, he's saying, no, no, it must be a practical joke. Some of the med students have got a leg in the middle of the night and they've come and they've put it in my bed with me just, and they've somehow, they've somehow connected it to me. And then there's this kind of realisation that this completely alien thing is somehow connected to you. But what was interesting, very, well, one of the things that was interesting about that, that uh, whole phenomenon is that the the leg had actually vanished from his, uh, from his body image. So he, he literally could not even imagine that it was there. Yeah? It was only because it forced itself on his awareness that he, he'd even notice it was there. Otherwise, it could just fall out of the bed and he wouldn't even realize it until, until the nurse would walk past and help him to put it back. It had just completely vanished from his sense of, of, of identity and self-awareness. And that's what real ignorance is about. Yeah? That's exactly what ignorance is about. It's when something has just completely gone, or it's never even... To, in that case, in that case he, it had been there, right? So he could force himself to think about it, yeah? But imagine if it had never been there. Imagine that if you're in that syndrome, where you're so totally alienated from it, and it had never been there, yeah? And yet it obviously is, right? <laughs> it obviously is there. This is what ignorance is. Yeah? We're so totally alienated from our own uh, uh, minds and from the depths of our own consciousness that we've never even imagined that it's there. Yeah? And so the forces, the motivations, the things that, that, are, that are driving us in our life are masked, masked so deeply that we're not even aware that they're there. And that's avidya that's doing that masking. And so when we talk about other things, we're talk, for example, we talk about greed, hatred, and delusion. Okay, so these are more the active motivating forces in the mind, greed, hatred, and delusion. That's because but these things are all masked by the ignorance. Okay, there's this very, this blindness. Yeah. So, that's the bad news, right? Bad news is we've got ignorance. And 
so does everyone around us. The good news is that the opposite of ignorance is knowledge. And just as we all have ignorance, we also have knowledge. Yeah? So the Buddha wasn't saying that all there is is ignorance. Okay? He wasn't saying you're all completely stupid and don't know anything. Right? He was saying that there is an opportunity to learn and that those things that we can learn are really important. Okay? We learn about ourselves, we learn about our own motivations, what, what's, well, how does our own mind work. So according to dependent origination, when we're ignorant, this then sparks out a series of actions and starts to move our mind. Again, I don't want to get too much into the details, but um, the essential uh, issue here is that um, our life is lived out within a complex of relations. Okay? For example, as we're sitting here now, let's just take sight, for example. You're sitting here, you're watching, or your eyes are closed, but there's some kind of external impingement. Okay? There's something from outside which feels like it's external. Okay? And then there's the internal, what's happening in here. Yeah? Which is the awareness of that. Okay? Yeah? The external field, sensory field, and then the internal awareness of that sensory field. We call it eye consciousness. And our, life, our, our, our visual life is lived out in that relationship. Okay? It's never wholly one thing or the other. It's never wholly external, nor is it wholly internal. In fact, we couldn't even begin to imagine what that would mean. Yeah? Experience is this relationship between the inner and the outer. Yeah? The same with hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, feeling things with our body, cognizing things with our mind. Now, the mind is much more complex and works in many different ways. The eye is good to start with because it's a straightforward example. It tells, shows how those things. The mind works in a similar way, although, of course, in you know, multi layers and dimensions and all of these kinds of things. But the basic principle is still the same that we have the things that we know, the things of which we are aware, which may be memories, ideas, thoughts, images. And then we have the knowing of those things. Yeah? This is what Buddha, the Buddha, what, sorry, what's called in the Upanishads. It talks about the unseen seer, the unheard hearer, the unsmelt smeller, the unthought thinker, the uncognized cognizer. Okay? So this is what we call the consciousness. And our life is lived out in this web of conditions and web of relations. And we are constantly affecting that. Our mind is constantly being involved in that process. It's not something that's just happening to us. We choose to open our eyes or to close them. When we open them, we choose what to look at. Yeah? We look, okay, that is conditioning our consciousness, conditioning our mind. Every moment is lived in that active conditionality, not just Passive conditions that we're subjected to, but active conditions that we are choosing at every moment. This is extremely important to understand. Every moment we're constructing the world from inside. Yeah? We're choosing what to listen to, what to see, how to pay attention. That doesn't mean that there's no external world, and it doesn't mean that the external world is not important. It just means that how we choose to relate to that external world, how we respond to that is our choice. Okay, and, uh, and so the Buddha pointed out that there are various aspects of this, this world, this kind of field or matrix of conditions which um, tend to pull us in one direction or another. For example, we, we talk about the three kinds of feelings, pleasant, painful or neutral feeling. And so these tend to, um, they create a dynamic, they create a movement in the mind. Yeah? And so it's interesting to watch how the Buddha talked about these things, that, that it's, not, it's not just about seeing whether you have a feeling or not, but about understanding what, how is that feeling moving my mind. You have a pleasant sensation, where does that move your mind? It moves your mind towards it. You want more. Yeah? You try to go toward more of that. Unpleasant sensation, you want to go away from it. And then neutral, you want to go towards it. 
And of course, the, sorry, it's a neutral sensation, you, you, you're bored. Okay, you tend to not pay attention to it. And of course, the interesting thing is that you know, our life's lived out in this, this constant movement of these drives and, and so on. And none of it actually is very satisfying because we try to get away from unpleasant feeling, but it always comes back. We try to move towards pleasant feeling and it always escapes from us and all of these kinds of things. So there's this constant effort of life. And that is the play of life. That's the game of life is how we negotiate these things. That's what the stuff of our life is. And if you want to enjoy life, you have to want to play the game. Yeah? So this is where I saw, when I was driving around Sydney one time, I saw a Porsche, and on the back of the Porsche it had a bumper sticker, and on the bumper sticker it said, whoever dies with most toys wins. <laughs> yeah? So that's somebody who wants to play the game and is quite happy with it. So good on them, yeah? They, they, they're well adjusted, they like to play the game. I have my suspicions about exactly, but at least they've got a degree of acceptance there. So that's all right. But there comes a time when you think, actually, I don't care how many toys I have when I die. Yeah? And then that becomes not so... And, and you realise this is this almost... This, this, this way ignorance works. So the great example of ignorance was at the, at the monastery just the other day. We had a bottle of fruit juice. So you can learn from all kinds of things. And this bottle of fruit juice, and, and it had big letters at the top of it, 50% less, less sugar yeah, on the fruit juice. That's good, isn't it? And you think, wow, 50% less sugar? It's great. And then in little letters down the bottom, it said 50% fruit juice. So it was 50% less sugar because half of it was water. Yeah? <laughs> so that's ignorance right there yeah that's a kind of diverting of attention yeah actually you could just buy the 100% fruit juice and mix it half with water but no 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 50% less, less sugar and that is ignorance right there so this is how advertising works this is how you know uh, all the kind of um, uh, uh, fictions and, and novels and all of these kinds of work, they work by playing these kinds of uh, motivations and so on off against each other. And they, they come, there's, there's, there's so much, um, you know, you, you've, got this, you've got these very, very simple things. The Buddha reduced it to very simple motivations, greed, hatred and delusion, you know, pleasant, painful and, unple and, pain and, and neutral feeling. It's very, very simple. And yet when we start to look at it, you realise actually this is what life is. More and more and more, you, that's what life is about. And then there comes a time when, like your mind changes and you experience what we call nibida. And nibida is quite a beautiful word, but uh, quite uh, powerful. And it refers to like, it's like a force that wants to push you or turn you away from those things. And uh, turn you towards letting go, towards peacefulness, towards freedom. And... Uh, there comes a time when, uh, in a sense, you just can't make yourself keep believing things anymore. It's not a voluntary thing. But it's just where you recognize the emptiness of them. And you recognize this is just what it is. It's nothing else. A taste is it's just a taste. Yeah? Sight is just a sight. And they can't, those things, they can't go beyond their own nature. They can't be more than what they are. An idea can be a great idea, but it can't ever be more than a great idea. It can't go beyond its own nature. And so the mind starts to cool off and starts to look for something else. And that something else is what we call Nibbāna. Except it's not something and it's not else. <laughs> right? So when you talk about nibbana, as soon as you want to, the best phrase to remember: yena yena hi manyanti hoti anyata. Whatever you think it is, it's something else. Right? And that's a very very precise statement on nibbana. Whatever you think it is, it's something else. So always remind yourself about that, and you say, "Oh, nibbana is this why this." You think whatever I think it is, it's something else. Keep reminding yourself of that. Because the more we try to pin it down, the more it tries to escape. Yeah? 
What is Nibbāna? The ending of ignorance, yeah? the arising of knowledge, huh? the ending of greed, hatred and delusion we call Nibbāna. So there are some words we use for Nibbāna which are very nice and very uplifting. We say Nibbāna is the refuge, the shelter, the harbour, the place of safety. Paramang Sukhang, the Buddha said. Nibbāna, Paramang Sukhang. Nibbāna is ultimate bliss. And so it makes you think, wow, I want a bit of that. I wouldn't mind some ultimate bliss. But then there's other things that are maybe quite challenging about Nibbāna. Yeah? Nibbāna bhavani rodho. Nibbāna is the ending of existence. So that sounds starting to sound a bit, getting a bit nervous now. Nibbāna is the ending of existence. What exactly does that mean? How can ultimate bliss be the ending of existence? Is there no feeling? How can, how can it be blissful if there's no feeling? And somebody once asked Venerable Sariputta this, how can Nibbāna be blissful if there's no feeling? And he said, Nibbāna is blissful precisely because there is no feeling. So then we start to think, hmm, yes, the Buddha did say this was one of the <laughs> most subtle and difficult things to teach. But the illustration of that particular dialogue was very interesting. And Sariputra illustrated it by talking about the jhanas. And so these states of, of concentration meditation. <clears throat> now what, you, what, what this shows was that, for example, you know, we're sitting here now, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thoughts and ideas and things, all this stuff is going on. Now if we're good meditators, diligent, clever, successful, we're going to first jhana. Okay? Even if you haven't been into a jhana or anything like that, just imagine it. What would happen if there's no sight, no smell, no smell, all this stuff is gone and there's just a beautiful, radiant, blissful consciousness? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Rapture, joy, light, and you just stay there for a while. And then you come back to the ordinary world, that's all right. But you just stay there for a while. Why is that blissful? It's blissful because the sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, this is all gone. Yeah? Because it's peaceful. You don't have to get involved in stuff. Your mobile phone can be ringing. You don't even hear it. That has dropped out of your awareness as much as Oliver Sacks' leg had dropped out of awareness. It's just not there anymore. And then as that jhanic experience deepens, even more the, the coarser feelings end and the, the, the more subtle feelings remain until the highest levels of jhana, then you just have neutral feeling, even pleasant feeling, even the most blissful feeling you can possibly have is still suffering. And have a neutral feeling instead. It's more peaceful. Yeah? It's more peaceful. And when you experience it, you understand it. So this is why it's very important to remember with Nibbāna that we can illustrate it and talk about it in these kinds of ways. But we can only really understand it through experience. And this is a very good uh, kind of analogy and way to start to get a handle on this, okay? So Nibbāna, another way of looking at it is, is, is if we like reflect on um, uh, how the ending within ourselves, our own mind and body, the ending of things which we see as suffering is very blissful. So for example, if we feel ill, okay, we get better, okay? What does that bliss of being better what does it actually consist of? Well, it doesn't actually consist of anything, does it? We can be better. We can do many different things being better. We can go for a walk in the park. We can sit at home and watch telly. We can, whatever we do, all these, we can do many different things. So there's no one thing which being better consists of. Yeah? And yet we say that being better is happiness compared to being sick. Yeah? Or even going to the toilet. Right? You really, really need to go. You're really desperate. Uh -huh. Very great suffering. You go to the toilet. It's relief. Why is it relief? There's no particular feeling that it, there's nothing that it consists of, and yet it's the relief of that pressure, relief of that pain. So this is why we have this kind of struggle with nibbana that we don't want to tie it down and say it's an existing thing. We don't want to say it's a state. We don't want to say it's a this or that. 
Because then we get into all these philosophical arguments and problems that we want to stay out of. But we do want to say that it's blissful. But it's blissful in that particular sense. So one way of summarising that is you can say that it's ontologically negative and psychologically positive. Okay? So it's ont presented in terms that are ontologically negative. So that means the Buddha would say there is. Right? So there is. So we, we think that there is something. And he says there is the unborn, unmade, uncreated, unconditioned. Right? So he says there is and then gives you a whole bunch of uns, nots. Yeah? The not, there is the not, 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 not. Yeah? So it's ontologically negative. So in terms of its existing status, we, say it's, we speak of it in negative terms. But it's psychologically positive. Yeah? It is the shelter, the harbour, the place of safety, the place of refuge, the undying, the uncreated, the, uh, um, the, the blissful, the peaceful, the sublime, and so on and so forth. And so what the, that, that psychological presentation of Nibbāna is trying to move our mind in that direction. Yeah? It's trying to awaken within us a longing for that peace yeah? and to hear of those things and to have a longing. Ah, what would that be like? To have an interest in it. <coughs> Not to think of it as something which is too unimaginable or remote. Yes, of course, it is inconceivably subtle, but we can start to understand just through simple things in our life what, what that is about. What, what is the depth of that subtlety? And then we can begin to orientate our lives in that direction and begin to think, no, it's not who dies with most toys wins. Right? It's who learns to be content with what they have. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Just to learn to be content. So that's a little bit of Nibbāna right there. Yeah? To learn that I don't have to always be grasping, I don't have to always be getting more money, I don't have to always be getting more things. Just to be content. To learn to uh, rejoice in the uh, happiness of giving rather than the happiness of getting. And this is very interesting because the word for giving in Pali is chaga. One of the words for giving is chaga. And it's just used in an ordinary sense of just giving to charity or giving a donation, something like that. But it's also used as a word for nibbana. Nibbana, chago, parinisago, giving, letting up, letting go. Yeah? So that, in that, we know that. We say, it's always, we say that, don't we? It's better to give than it is to receive. We all know that. We've known that since we were kids. In that pleasure of giving a gift, that is a piece of nibbana. Because that's the pleasure of letting go, not the pleasure of getting. And so it has the same essence as Nibbāna. And so each time that we reflect like this, then there's a little bit of wisdom starts to arise in our mind. So we should always notice this. Whenever we do something good, an act of giving, an act of kindness, even if it's tiny, even if it's just opening the door for somebody, even if it's just noticing an ant on the ground and not stepping on it, yeah? even if it's just making a cup of tea for somebody, anything that we do, this is a little piece of Nibbāna. Yeah? And ref we reflect on that. Why does it feel nice to do that for somebody? Yeah? Because there's letting go in that. And that's the happiness of letting go. So this is my little talk for you this evening on dependent origination and Nibbāna. And I offer that to you for your reflection and amusement. <laughs>